Jules Joseph Gislaine Delgado lost the game primarily because of his seventh move, a innocent pawn move that pushed upon gaining space and grabbing a tempo. Let's figure out why, in my explanation of the book from Erning Chernev, Logical Chess, we're going to talk about the third game in this book between Edgar Collet and Jules Joseph Gislaine Delvaux. Stay tuned. We're going to look at a short but sweet Collet system game. You've probably heard of the Collet before. It's a famous opening, and we're looking at the man who made it popular. In fact, this game made the Collet system work. Let me explain how. So white starts off with the move pawn to d4. If you're not familiar with the Kale system, let's let Mr. Kale introduce it to you. So Mr. JJGB played knight to f6 and knight to f3. And after e6, white plays the rather unambitious seeming move pawn to e3. And then after black's d5, bishop d3 and c5, White plays c3, a completely uh, black opening. I mean, this looks just like the Simislav from Black's perspective, or what I like to call the pyramid defense. It is not that aggressive at all, it doesn't seem, but it lays a trap in the mind. Let's take a look. Here, Black plays the best move, the knight c6, and White plays knight d2. After bishop to e7 and castles, We've reached move seven. A little bit of foreshadowing happened earlier in the video, and I told you that in this position, Black was going to make a game-altering decision for the worse. This decision turned the entire tables against him. If you remember, I told you it was a space-grabbing and tempo-gaining move. What was it? Black played the move, c4. And you can see, look at the bar on the side here. If you can't see it, look right on the edge of your screen. The bar is close to the middle. And look at the bar begin to rise. This is a big advantage for the strong players of the board here. Already, this should be a nearly winning advantage for white. After one quiet pawn move. Why? Well, first off, if you haven't watched the first two videos in this series on the book, Logical Chess, and make sure you go ahead and do that because especially the second game, we see a very similar pawn structure where we had four pawns locked together like this. Four pawns made the game. It told us which way we should attack. So to refresh your memory, if you don't want to go back and watch that video, you definitely should. But the direction the pawns are aiming dictate where you should attack if the center is closed in almost every case. So here, we have a connect four, which I think means black wins. Wait, no, never mind, wrong game. But still, the point is very obvious. He's attacking on the queen side. He's got space on the queen side and very logical moves to come after, let's say you castle, would probably be b5, a5, b4, maybe bishop d7, queen d6, uh, and then bring the rook from f8 to b8, and then eventually play a4, a3, take on b2, take on c3, open up the lines. The a2 pawn will be a vulnerable, potentially this pawn on uh, c4 could be a pass pawn. This will be a very great strategy. The only problem is it takes like 300 moves, and white is going to beat you before that. And how do I know that? Well, uh, I don't know that white's going to win per se, but I do know that white is going to have a strategy that comes much quicker. White strategy uh, which way is white's pawn structure pointing? It seems like the middle, right? Well, no, so because black has such a large space advantage on the queen side, uh, it's pretty obvious that we're not going to play on the queen side. So that means by default, we need to play on the king side. So if it's white to play here, after we played uh, the move bishop to c2, and black goes ahead and plays b5, what should white play? If we're supposed to play on the king side of the board, our pieces are as developed as they can be right now, it makes sense to gain space. We currently have no space advantage on the king side, but that's the side we needed to attack on. So how do we gain space? Well, let's not play h4 because the central space matters more than the side space. So e4 
This is a very natural move for a strong chess player. Uh, and this is the main reason the Kale system works. The idea is to push the E pawn and to attack on the king side. So black now takes on E4. And after the knight takes back, we see castles. And now the plan is very obvious. Black will beat us on the queen side. You've got a, a big space advantage and a time advantage on that side of the board. His pieces are all easily flowing into the queen side and will completely overwhelm us. But the same can be said on the king side for white. We are going to attack there. Our pieces are going to flow into the position faster than black can dam up them up. And that's exactly what white does. White starts with queen to e2, a rather innocuous looking move. But the idea is to prop the queen a little bit more. For what? Well, we have a threat here. We actually have a game-winning threat. Let's just say that in this position, a6 is played. Look at that bar jumping up. What's the winning line? Can you find it? Well, pause if you haven't yet You want to, and you want to try it yourself. The correct move is knight takes f6. Why? Pause again if you don't know. After bishop takes or pawn takes, doesn't make a difference. What's the point? What's the point? Queen e4. And this hits the knight, and it double attacks the h7 pawn, which would be checkmate. So this is a nasty threat. The move queen e2 is a quiet move, but a devastatingly strong move. And that's why black played bishop to b7, so that now, if we play the move, he played knight g5. If we play the move, knight takes f6, bishop takes f6, queen to e4 is no longer threatening the knight, and we're only threatening the pawn, which can be defended with uh, maybe g6. Okay, so knight g5, knight f g5 was played, and the point is extraordinarily subtle. And this is, this is hard for me to explain. I'm trying to make this as simple and digestible as possible. But let's just say that White saw some tactical ideas and he wanted to set up his position to the max. So h6 was played, but now the tactics work. Here White started off with knight takes f6 and after bishop takes f6, he played the extremely natural queen to e4, of course, just a threatening checkmate on h7. And the whole idea behind this knight g5 is about to be shown because here, of course, black has to play g6. And what was white's winning move here? There's only one. Literally every other move gives black an advantage thanks to the potential discovered attacks on the queen. The knight can go somewhere and cause white problems. There's only one correct move. And what is that? It's knight takes e6. Beautiful move. Quite natural. If you're looking for tactics, looking for checks and captures, now the pawn has to take back because otherwise you're going to lose your queen or your rook. And um, well, I mean, I guess that's what you should. You should, in this position, realize that you're going to lose the game if you take back like this, which will, of course, open up g6. So yeah, you probably should actually just like move your queen or something like that, like that right? Or, or maybe move this knight to counterattack the queen. You, you just got to go ahead and do that. You're just going to, you're probably going to lose. But all right, takes back because otherwise you're just down a pawn and more material to fall soon. Makes sense. But now white just wins with the move, of course. Queen takes g6, bishop g7, queen to h7, king to f7, bishop g6, king f6. And the king is a very slippery fish. He's constantly getting out of our grasp, but that's okay. We're going to, we're going to uh, slowly rein him in. And, uh, you know, just like a, a slippery fish, you don't need to constantly be grabbing at him. You need to try to corral him, bring him together. Here, the move, bishop h5 doesn't try to make the fish move. It tries to create the threats. Now, of course, the threat is queen to g6. And once the king moves, you lose your bishop for free. So here, uh, black plays knight to e7 to prevent our queen from coming here. But that's okay, because we've got another setup move. Bishop takes h6, now setting up the threat of bishop takes g7 or queen takes g7. Uh, there's not much that can be done about that threat. Rook g8 to defend the bishop was the most logical move here. But after h4, the game ended immediately following bishop takes h6, allowing a checkmate on the board. But if you don't play that, your best move, according to the computer, is the checkmate threatening queen d5. Don't forget about your opponent's threats here. But after bishop to g5 check, you will have to sacrifice your queen. No time to checkmate us. And you will not get checkmated right away, but 
you're down a queen against the Kale master. You are going to lose. So here, uh, Black took the bishop, the only way to try. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if uh, queen takes on h6, the game is far from over, thanks to the move knight g6. But if you find the right move, it's checkmate right on the board. White to play, queen to f7, checkmate. Very nice move. And a wonderful game from Mr. Edgar Colley. So hopefully you guys learned a little something from this video. If you did, make sure to hit the like button, comment. Let me know that you want to see more of these videos, and I will make more. This is only game three of, what, 32 in this book? So we got quite a bit more to go. I'm looking forward to producing those. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.